Hey guys, Keegan here, and uh, I'm a grill table addict. I've built quite a few of these, and uh, today I want to share all my mistakes with you so you don't make the same mistakes. And uh, some of these are mistakes I've made, and some of these I know are mistakes that either uh, my viewers who have bought the plans or just building their own tables have made or have thought about making. Um, either cutting corners or just mistakes that you don't think about because it's your first build. So. Let's go ahead and reel off my top 10 mistakes and tips to help you build a quality table. So one of the mistakes I know people have made in the past is not allowing enough room for the hinge to float above the countertop here. So you can see I got about an inch to work with there and uh, just always check your own grill because sometimes things change. Uh, Green Egg changed their, their hinge in the last two, three years or so it was. So it's definitely different than it was. So if you get online, it might be the wrong specification. So definitely check the depth of that before you build your table. Especially if you got one of these big guys, it's tough to move once you get it set, like the XL. Now, I wasn't planning on touching base on this one, but I know people ask on this quite a bit and is what do you want to finish your table with underneath the egg? And can you set your, your egg directly on it? And now, after doing this a number of times, I always recommend having a gap, having some sort of air space between your egg and the surface, and then either using granite, which is, you know, can be a little bit of an expensive option, but you can go find a remnant at a granite supplier very easily for pretty, pretty cheap. Um, or you can use, instead of having this granite here, you can have a, uh, just a metal surface. So using like aluminum flashing to make sure that it's just some sort of non-flammable surface that would reflect the heat. Um, when you have this table nest here and you have a couple inches in between, um, having just something non-flammable should be, should be fine. But I would still recommend doing that rather than having wood directly below it. And this is my large egg setup. And you can see that, you know, this is just using the feet, still have the granite. If I didn't have the granite here, I still recommend using some sort of metal, something non-flammable right underneath it. So that way, if you have a little ash pop out the front, you're not setting your table on fire and uh, calling the fire department or getting out, and, getting out the hose and ruining your setup. The next set of tips has to do with hinges. I think this is something that a lot of people are intimidated by and I've made my fair share of mistakes but you definitely learn from them and there's just a few things to look out for as you're mounting doors using European hinges and, and that's that could be a separate tip in itself. Use European hinges. Make sure don't go cheap. Just get the good stuff. All right let's take a look. Okay so the first thing first tip about hinges is make sure to get one that has also a height adjustment as well that raises up and down. Not all of these have that. Um, the ones I'm recommending currently do. So when you're going to purchase hinges, make sure not only do they have up down, but back front, and then it kind of pulls this out. So it's, it's basically three directions, which this adjusts in, which means it's gonna give you a, a lot easier time when you adjust the, the doors for uh, after you mount them. Um, some other things to look out for hinges is to make sure that you look at where the hinge is actually going to mount. In this case, this is smooth plywood all the way down, so that's not a concern. But some of my other tables in the past, you might have something that would get in the way of that hinge mounting. So check that out before you line it up on your door. For example, on the Rectech table I built, you will find these overlay hinges and here, here's some uh, pocket hole screws I barely missed. Um, so check those things as well. It, it's ideal not to be spanning this gap here as well if you have some framing in there. So always check your, your actual placement and relative to the door, take some measurements and then based off that, choose your locations. Um, the other thing too is even if you're doing overlay doors, versus the inset ones we saw before, you wanna make sure that your trim piece here is completely flush with your framing behind it. In this case, I got a little lazy and uh, had to route off part of the frame afterwards, which was doable but was not fun. So anyway, take the time up front as you're building it to look at the, all the little details uh, before you start uh, you know, your finishing work. 
All right, tip number three, go for the big casters. Now, wherever you get them from, I like to use these four inch casters. They got kind of like a, I call it like a, a rollerblading wheel for you know any of us that grew up in the uh, 90s, I guess, 80s and 90s. Nice smooth texture, rolls smooth, uh, not incredibly bumpy, and uh, just rolls really nice. Let me show you something I don't recommend. These little guys are probably more in the two inch category or so, and they work, but they don't roll smooth, um, incredibly bumpy, kind of rough on the table itself. So if you're gonna go through the trouble of building this nice table, go for the big casters, you won't regret it. All right, the next tip is build to maximize your cabinet space. And when I, sounds like a no brainer, but how do you actually do that? Well, it's how you manipulate your simple materials. So all the ones I built in the recent past, when you're building up with your framework, if you're building a house, you would generally have your, you know, your two by fours oriented this way. You know, it's nice and strong, it's stable, but for something like this, if you orient them this way, then it's nice streamlined fashion. You can keep things nice and narrow. So it keeps the, our dividers narrow on the outside and in between. And over the span of a larger cabinet, this adds up a lot. And even on a smaller cabinet like this, you're saving a couple inches on each side that is usable space. So it just makes these narrow spots be able to be a little wider and your larger areas give you even more room. So make sure to maximize by building vertically in a nice streamlined fashion. All right, one of the areas I think people make a lot of mistakes is just choosing the right fastener and they're not sure maybe what to choose. Um, and then just kind of go with what's at the hardware store. Um, so I just want to go through what I typically carry on hand for the most part um, and proper use for them. So on the right here, we have like a three and one eighth inch stainless screw, uh, star bit. I prefer star bit for about everything, uh, just a lot easier than trying to drive a Phillips screwdriver. So I would look for that when you're buying screws in general, that just makes things nice and easy. And the stainless you want to use, um, you can use for anything. So if you buy stainless, it's good for everything. Um, consider like all applications, but they're a little on the pricier side, um, but they're very nice. I actually re you know, took about a bunch of these from a recent project I built four or five years ago and reused them. They're perfectly good. And then there's other screws that have more of a coating, like a zinc coating on it. And these are fine for exterior use, but you may get some rust at some point on them. So you know, for the interior side of the project for like a grill table, uh, outdoor kitchen build, this is fine, but probably not using it for anywhere it's showing on the exterior. And then we have our Craig screws and you just wanna make sure for these pocket hole screws, if you're using these, um, you know, I carry two inch, two and a half, um, all the different sizes, but try to use the exterior grade um, with this blue coating. A lot of them, that are not have, do not have this coating are rather cheap and they will rust out and fail at some point. Um, you might not see it fail in your project, but if you go to back out, I've, I've tried to remove some of these screws in the past after years of use outside and they do, they'll snap off. So um, just be aware of that. And then our trim screws, the type I usually use are either these GRK um, with a coating on it that are, you know, says you can look for it says treated lumber approved you know so that's you know a good sign that it's going to hold up well on any project um, but they're approved for exterior as well and then once again stainless screws that will hold up forever um, you can repurpose these as long as you you have them really um, and i try to go stainless if i can and then my second fiddle are these different materials and coatings that are also exterior approved. But just make sure they're exterior approved and also look to make sure if, you're, if you are using treated, that they're treated approved. For instance, these are not approved for treated. So you'd wanna go stainless or another variety you find at the hardware store, but just check all the labels before you start using these things. And one last note on all these screws, if you can see here, they have a little self-tapping mechanism on the tip and 
All these have that and they just make it a lot easier to drive into wood and you get less cracking. So look for these self-tapping varieties as well. All right, our next tip and discussion is around screws versus finish nails. And for a project like a outdoor kitchen grill table setup and you're using car you know, carpentry build, you can use either for a lot of different applications. I tend to think of as screws uh, using for anything that I need to make sure it's fastened down strongly. So I wanna make sure that the countertop is fastened down. Um, so I'll make sure to use screws for the countertop and that way I can easily remove countertop pieces if I were to have a board that were to rot, rot out or just get warped over time. Um, where the sides, I will generally use finish nails. Now, that being said, if I was a patient man, I would prefer to use these nice stainless, little stainless screws for every two at the top, two at the bottom uh, for every connection, but I'm not patient, so I will generally use these uh, you know, pneumatic finish nail gun. However, you should know these will leave black marks eventually as they kind of rust out um, the finish on them. So you'll see that on your, on your cedar over time. So you should just know that. If you want to keep it really clean looking, go with your little stainless trim screw and that'll never treat you wrong. Okay, this is kind of a funny tip slash mistake. I did make this, this is one of my own. Um, and that was building something you can't fit through the walkout garage door to your backyard. And in my case, it's kind of a pain in the butt to go from the front yard to the backyard otherwise. So measure that, you know, garage door opening if that's what you're kind of stuck with as far as getting from the garage to the back patio and, and don't get too far along in your construction before you get it moved to the back and, and finish your assembly. So yeah, that was a fun one. All right, I get a lot of questions on materials. So the next tip is just generally what materials you should use. And for the framing, you can go pine, pressure treated, or cedar. Um, this day and age with the money, if I'm building a new table, at this point I'm probably gonna build it with just straight pine and then build it in a way that's gonna keep it dry. Um, so really keeping it dry means your countertop building that as something that's going to be fairly waterproof. Um, so like the latest larger table that I built is, you know, I put soapstone on top of it. You could also use granite and that'll keep it dry underneath. Um, or you can join the boards on top using cedar, for instance, and fasten those together and then create a countertop that is generally waterproof if it's sealed. Um, so for the money, go with, uh, I'd probably go with the just straight pine for the interior framing. And then the exterior, I would generally still try to do out of cedar um, because you're going to save, I think in the long run, you're just going to be you're gonna save your table from deteriorating. Even if you don't seal cedar for the vertical areas, it'll, it'll generally just form kind of like this gray patina and it stays really nice uh, and, and tough on the inside for those vertical uh, siding pieces. So that is what I would use for materials and I think it'll treat you really well. All right, my next mistake that I've seen a lot of people make is has to do with countertop space and they generally make it too small or leave no counter space on one side of the grill or the other, which I think you're gonna regret in the end. So all of my setups will have generally countertop space on each end, unless it's just the classic sidecar egg table. But I would recommend going with a table or a setup that you design yourself that has ample room on both sides. You're gonna want, generally what I shoot for is no less than 18 inches on each side of the grill. And that'll at least allow you to have like a full sheet pan on each side, you know, to get meat on and off the grill. Um, it's nice to have, you know, this is probably closer to like 30 inches or so, and then you could have two sheet pans side by side. So think about how you're going to use the space and make sure not to limit yourself in the future by, I guess, cutting corners or making the areas too small as long as you have the space. Okay, the last tip of the day is how do you finish off this table? Should I seal it? Should I not? Uh, the short answer is yes, I think you should seal the table. And a lot of people say, what should I seal it with? And the only thing I'm using right now, the only thing I'm recommending is Penafin Ultra. Uh, you can find it at usually Ace Hardware stores if you have those close to you or like high-end Woods. Uh, Woodsmith is a store here in Des Moines. I'm not sure those are national, but any of the high-end wood stores, uh, you know, where you buy fancy tools and stuff should have Penafin Ultra. Um, but just, you know, check that out. It'll treat you really well. I used it on the table behind me that I built last year. I just built a new one a new cart uh, a few days ago and I use it as well. It's the only thing I recommend and it'll, 
if you went through this trouble to build this beautiful grill cart, grill table, outdoor kitchen, uh, put something on that's gonna last a long time, and this will generally last you at least a couple years and look great doing it. And uh, yeah, finish out that table in class, be proud of it, show it off, make the backyard a little nicer. If you have tips of your own, make sure to put them in the comments so other people can see them. Or if you just have questions in general, let me know and I get back to everybody uh, with questions that they answer through the website or on the comments down below. And if you're building your own grill table and you haven't seen some of my other videos, I'll put the playlist up here uh, in the corner uh, for all my grill table videos. If you haven't seen some of those builds, check them out. And you can find all these plans at searedandsmoked.com as well if you're looking for grill table plans. I always got you covered.